Oh, there we go. All right, I think it's safe to get started. Welcome everyone to Domestic Violence Through Our Eyes. This is a webinar put on by Hear Our Voices and the Family Homelessness Coalition. I'm your host, Rebecca Charles. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I do wanna plug that the Hear Our Voices podcast is a new podcast episode is launched every Wednesday and this webinar recording will be launched next Wednesday. And if you see in the corner there, um, we would love for you to follow the Hear Our Voices podcast on both Instagram and Twitter. Uh, today's agenda, we're going to start with some housekeeping and introductions, and then we're going to do a review of statistics and the cycle of domestic violence. Then we're going to have a panel discussion with some really awesome panelists, and then we're going to disseminate resources and we're gonna close that out with a moment of silence for domestic violence victims, and then have a Q&A session with the audience. Speaking of the Q&A, please add your questions to the chat starting now, whatever questions come up, and we will do our best to answer questions live. And if they can't be answered live, we can uh, they can be addressed individually. You can reach out to us or we can follow up through email. My name is Rebecca Charles. I'm a policy and advocacy associate with the Citizens Committee for Children. I've been with CCC now for the past year. In my role, I work to pass policies at the city and state levels that will ensure every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. DV, which is domestic violence for short, I will be referring it to that, referring to it that way many times throughout this webinar. It's an issue really close to my heart. Um, I've lost someone very close to me to domestic violence, and it's really important to me now to raise awareness about the realities of DV and how impactful it can be, especially in the lives of families and children. I hold a bachelor's degree in political science from Pace University and a master's in social work from Columbia University. Our first panelist is named Sammy. She is a lived expert um, with domestic violence. She is also a coordinator of community development and outreach for the New York courts, and she's a chair member of the New York Youth Action Board. As I mentioned, she's a survivor and humanitarian, and she spends a lot of her time advocating for other survivors and youth. She's a mom of two and loves to create safer spaces for the future. She's been working in the community facing field for the last five years, creating curriculum and safe spaces for youth and survivors and raising awareness for different nonprofits and schools around New York City. Destiny Sheftal is our second panelist. She is also a lived expert and she's a Family Homelessness Coalition Fellow and I will get more into that in a few slides. She joined the fellowship in 2022. She's a mother of a seven-year-old and she's a student pursuing a bachelor's degree in marketing. Um, Destiny believes in creating a safe environment for families, especially families with children. And this work is really important to her to advocate for, to, to help families and children advocate for themselves and their communities. And then lastly, we have Jimmy Marr. He is the policy director at Safe Horizon. He went to Haverford College and after graduating in 2008, he joined Safe, Safe Horizon as a client advocate in the Brooklyn Criminal Court Program. Since then, he's moved into different roles within the Criminal Court Program, the Manhattan Family Justice Center, and the Government Affairs Office. While working at Safe Horizon, he obtained his master's in social work at the Silverman School of Social Work at Hunter College, and he previously oversaw the Domestic Violence and Empowerment Initiative at Safe Horizon. I've mentioned the Family Homelessness Coalition a bit already. Um, I just want to give you more of an outline of what that is, where um, Coalition composed of advocates, experts, and service providers across New York City were dedicated to shining a light on family homelessness in New York City and passing policies that end, advancing policies that end homelessness. And for us, that means not only focusing on families and shelter, but also focusing on prevention, working upstream to prevent and avert family homelessness, 
working to improve shelter environment, improve the lives of families in shelter, and then also addressing the lives after shelter, which is aftercare, affordable housing, and ensuring that we're mitigating the risk of families re-entering shelter. FHC has a fellowship program, and that's what I've mentioned a little bit already as well. Destiny, one of our panelists, is a fellow. These fellows are amazing women, and they're all mothers with lived um, expertise of homelessness and housing instability, and they advocate for people with lived experiences, particularly, particularly families with children. They share their stories and resources through the Hear Our Voices podcast, which I've mentioned already, and we're going to link that in the chat. They share on social media, and they do a lot of community outreach and engagement. They work with the Family Homelessness Coalition to ensure that we strengthen the partnership and collaboration with the community of families who are experiencing homelessness so that FHC is including people with lived experiences in their policy priorities. So now we're going to jump into some statistics on domestic violence, also called, also referred to as intimate partner violence. A lot of these statistics are jarring, and I'll be honest, um, these were, these were statistics I did not know about for, for much of my life until recently, unfortunately. Um, an average of 24 people per minute are victims of rape, physical violence, or stalking. So that comes to more than 12 million women and men in a single year. While domestic violence can happen to any woman at any age, it is most common um, among women ages 18 through 34. And it is very common for female victims to go back to their abuser and to be re-victimized. And that is at a very high rate for ages 35 to 49. It's at a rate of 76% for ages 25 to 34 and 77% for ages 18 to 24. One in four women will experience domestic violence during her lifetime. And I think that is that was a very jarring statistic for me to learn. Um, and then one in seven men will also be the a victim of intimate partner violence. And so why that's so jarring to me and like I think important for us to, to really focus on is that I don't think people realize how common domestic violence is. Um, domestic violence doesn't discriminate based on socioeconomic status, race, class, education level, or geographic location. Domestic violence can truly happen to anyone. Um, it can happen to someone you know, it can happen to you, and it has most likely happened to someone you care about and love, and you may not even know it. It's a very, very common issue, and that's why we're having this, pot, or this webinar today to raise awareness of it. And then finally, we're gonna just look at what is domestic violence. I know a lot of times you would think of physical violence as domestic violence, um, and that is domestic violence, but it comes in different forms as well. And it can start in different ways. It can start with emotional and mental abuse. It can start with intimidation, um, you know, just smashing things or harming children or the pets around the victim to make the victim afraid. Um, emotional abuse, putting the victim down, calling her names, gaslighting the victim, humiliating her, um, manipulation as well is something that an abuser can do, saying things like, I don't want you around your friends, I don't want um, your friends in our home, you don't, you don't need your friends, you only need me, so that's using isolation, um, using the children, I saw this a lot when I worked in the child welfare space, Many abusers will call ACS on their victim in order to intimidate them and, and make them think that their children are going to be taken away. And that way, the victim complies with what the abuser is doing. There's also economic abuse. I hear about this often where a woman is given an allowance. Um, a victim is not allowed to use credit cards or open a bank statement, and they have to rely on their abuser to access any money, which is obviously a huge issue and a huge barrier to getting out of the domestic violence relationship. And then there's other things like using coercion and threats, um, minimizing, denying, and blaming the victim, making the victim think that everything bad that is happening to the victim is their fault. And also um, using male privilege, treating the victim like a servant, 
um, making all the major decisions for the family or the couple and being the one who def defines the woman's role in a relationship. So now we're actually gonna jump into our panel discussion, which I'm really excited for. Um, like I said, we have Sammy, Destiny, and Jimmy here today, and they are just going to be touching on some of their experiences with domestic violence and some of their knowledge from working in this space. So welcome you three, thank you so much for being with us today. I am going to start with a very broad question. And this um, is directed at both Destiny and Sammy. When did you realize you were experiencing domestic violence? Um, Sam, do you wanna go first or do you want me to try mm -hmm. first? Okay, so for me, it took a governmental like agency, ACS, coming into like the household to explain that I was going through a domestic violence situation because we end up having um, an old physical altercation outside. And of course, child services is called. And they set me down and told me, you are in a domestic violence relationship. Like this is not a safe environment for like a child to be raised in. And at first I didn't want to believe it because we didn't fight like every day or every week. It happened like monthly or like it was time spaced out before any like physical violence occurred. So I didn't really believe it or I didn't think I was in that relationship until it took someone from a governmental agency to tell me that. Um, a little bit of like what Destiny said, my experience was similar. I was very young, so I didn't really um, identify my relationship as DV until like two years into it, where um, as I went into like the social work field and I wanted to become a mentor, I started to surround myself with like um, different nonprofits that was running groups and I'm a, I'm a person I like to laugh so I would have like dark humor and I would be cracking up and people would look at me and kind of be like um that's not funny like that's that's not normal and it took me two years to kind of realize like oh this is not what people are experiencing like this doesn't make me a good girlfriend so um a lot like what destiny said it was the help of like other nonprofits, but just other women in general who was kind of like yeah th this is not this is this isn't healthy for you thank you both and i think that really really points to why it's important that we raise awareness of what domestic violence is and destiny you touched on you know, you said it wasn't happening so often or it wasn't always physical. And so maybe you just didn't realize that something was wrong. And Sammy, you mentioned that it took other people like putting things into perspective for you. And I'm really happy that you shared things with other people, even if you were just doing it in a, in a comedic way. I'm happy that you did voice those things because they were flagged to you. Um, but this is why it's really important that we raise awareness of what DV is, because it's not just physical violence. And that leads me into my next question. What are the signs of domestic violence? And all three of you might have an answer for this one. For me, the signs always vary from situation to situation. But one thing that I can say that's across like all the boards of form of violence is basically not good communication because not good communication often leads into physical violence or leads into emotional abuse and even financial abuse because if you don't have that good open line of communication they're like it just basically leads it open for all types of forms of the domestic violence um for me i think um just how my body reacted i feel like if you're laying down crying yourself to sleep or really just questioning yourself even if it's just a small question on like damn this really sucks why is this happening to me I feel like that was the biggest flag that I ignored before everything else I kind of wish that that first flag of well is this normal or should I get help or should I talk to somebody like I think that for me just how my body got sick how my my and not just my physical body of like 
my reactions, but like emotionally, I wanted to like kind of seek help, but I wasn't sure yet. I felt like that was the biggest flag for me. And what I would add, um, and thank you, Destiny and Sammy, for sharing your for uh, sharing your personal stories. Um, one thing that I've learned, especially from uh, the survivors that I've worked with, with colleagues, um, and specifically um, colleagues from another organization. So I work for Safe Horizon, um, but the Anti-Violence Project during um, some trainings about domestic violence, the way that they framed things was with, um, with an abusive relationship with domestic violence, with intimate partner violence, one person's world is getting smaller while the other person's world might be getting bigger. Um, so really thinking about the isolation that you mentioned, Rebecca, um, and, and what Sammy and Destiny shared is that through all of these different tactics, one person is kind of being isolated. Um, and domestic violence, it's about power and control. So, I mean, that was the wheel that we looked at, the power and control wheel. Like that, that is really the lens um, through which I look at all of this work. Um, and I mean, that's why we're, what we're trying to build is like some empowerment work so that survivors are able to regain that power and control in their lives. And I have colleagues who this is their, this is the work that they do. And still they, they, like, they realize like they're in an abusive relationship, even though they might be the ones answering those hotline calls, being the case manager, working with survivors day in and day out. And still they, they find, um, down the road that they're in, that the relationship that they are, they're in is unhealthy, um, and abusive and controlling. Yes. Thank you so much. And I, yeah, I mean, Jimmy, I do also want to recognize that it's hard to, it's very easy to help someone else and to give advice to someone else in many aspects of life. But this is one of the areas where I myself have ignored signs because I didn't feel like addressing them. And I felt like, well, if I keep this to myself, no one else will have to know. And it's just kind of, it, it can be scary to address, especially when you're dealing with an abusive person. Um, and it can be scary to admit that you're in the situation, um, whether that's because of, you know, pride or fear or whatever. Like it can just be hard to admit, like this is also me while also helping other people. Um, and Sam, I really liked what you said about listening to your body. I think that is very important in life in general. And sometimes our bodies tell us things before we're aware of them. And I think that was a really important point that you made. Are there any signs of abuse, Sammy and Destiny, that you missed um, when you were in these relationships? Um, some of the signs I missed was the relationship that they had with other people, like their family and their friends. It wasn't really what I would consider a good relationship. And that is a form of a relationship and most likely how they treat their friends or their family is how they would treat you. And I also miss the signs of the disrespect, like the subtle disrespect remarks that happened early on in the beginning of the relationship before it got physical. Cause I felt like sometimes they see how far they can get away with disrespecting you and see what you're willing to like take in regards to the relationship. So those are like the few signs that I personally miss. Um, similar to Destiny, but a little bit opposite in my situation was, um, yes, the relationship they had with others, but one thing I missed was like how popular and kind and easygoing and charming he was to everybody else. And with me, it was like a completely different feel. And I feel like I caught myself so many times being like, but he's a great mentor and like he's a great artist and he's a great this. So he can't be a bad person because why is it only me? So I felt like that was, um, you know, similar to Destiny. That was my thing that I overlooked for a long time, actually. I just kept comparing, oh, but he has a hundred friends. So if I'm the only one complaining, then it's me. And I felt like um, that's the one regret I have. Yeah, I think you both touched on like two sides of it where there's the abuser who abuses everyone in their life and is doesn't have a lot of people around them that want to be around them. And that's a very clear sign. But then the sign that Sammy mentioned is it's like gaslighting where, you know, especially narcissists have that tendency to be very, very charming and come across as someone you want to be around and someone who really cares 
really they they don't care about you um they care about themselves but they are around you the most so you're going to see the worst side of them and they're able to charm other people and it can be very very confusing to the person in the relationship um so thank you so much for raising that um and this one can be for all three of you i'm curious why victims sometimes return to or stay with abusers and all three of you feel free to answer that okay so for me i feel like there's two parts of this so personally i feel like looking at movies and growing up in life like i came up from a family that was always loud like my dad was always cracking jokes on my mom my mom um we live just in a very loud, like everybody was yelling, everybody was screaming and stuff like that. So when I got into a relationship, I felt like I didn't really know certain triggers. But what I did know was that I was I was um raised off of survival and not love. So he was the first person to really ever show me love. He was my first date. He was the first person to ever buy me flowers. He was the first person. Um, so that control he had over me, I mistaken it for support. And every time I left him and I would go to shelters and I would go to youth shelters, I felt like I no longer had support because I didn't really have family. I, I was in like shelters and stuff. So no matter how many times I would leave, I always kind of felt like, this I owe this person like you took a chance for me you provided for me um you gave me a home you gave me love so I will always go back because I, I had like self-guilt like I, I was like well maybe I'm doing something wrong or maybe he would change you know so I felt like even though I was the victim I was making him a victim too and that always put me back into his house because a part of me would like mentally punish myself for going through what I was going through. Because again, like I was always comparing um, his relationship with everybody else. And to add on to what Sam was saying, in a city like New York where things are so expensive, sometimes it's economical pressure and people feel like they cannot make it on a one income or even if they have one income, that luxury of having an income, it's so hard for them to just stand on their own and be by themselves, especially sometimes in a domestic violence relationship, codependency happens. And now it's like, it's so hard for you to even envision your life without this other person. You then made plans for the future. You know, you saw your whole life with them. So sometimes it's hard to abandon those plans, even though they're not safe or it's actually affecting your mental health, your physical health. And sometimes there also is family influence, especially I feel with women, um, there's a stigma behind being a single mom or just like not being married at a certain age. So sometimes they force you to go back into this relationship or they give you misled, misled advice on how, what they would do in that situation. And it could be really hard with, you know, family pressure and society pressure. Yeah, I mean, just to, to add onto that, um, I mean, we as a society, we always ask, why did she stay? Why did she go back? Um, why did he stay? Why did he go back? Why did they stay? Why did they go back? We put all of the pressure on the person experiencing harm and violence. We never really ask the questions on like, what led that person to abuse? Why do they abuse? Why do they hurt people that they love? Um, so, I mean, several years ago, this um, there were some uh, hashtags that were trending on Twitter for those that use Twitter. It's like, why I left, why I stayed. And there were survivors sharing their own stories that there are so many reasons why people stay in abusive relationships. The reasons that Sammy and Destiny were just saying, one, a lot of times I don't think that we like to say, but love, like sometimes people stay for love and go back for love, for the kids, for the economic reasons, for immigration reasons. Um, so there are those personal reasons, but then there are also those larger systemic reasons. So like Sammy and Destiny were saying, like we have folks that are in domestic violence shelter for a very, like for many, many months. And then like, if you time out, you go into the homeless shelter system. And sometimes it's like, you know, the, it's like the devil I know versus the devil I don't know. It's like, well, I know how to deal with that person. Like I've been able to manage that. I do not want to have to deal with all of these other violent systems that we as society create and force survivors to like go through the gauntlet to to survive 
Um, so sometimes it's those systemic reasons, especially when we're talking about economic, like economic reasons and housing reasons. Like right now we are, have a housing and homelessness crisis here in New York City and across the country. So of course there are just so many of those like systemic reasons why folks do it. go back. Um, and just one last thing that like one thing that I really learned from the work, the, the years of working with survivors is that um, the abuse that they were experiencing from the from their partner, their former partner was terrible. But sometimes the pain that they came in to talk about was, you know, I told my mom and she was so disappointed in me. She said, I didn't raise you to be abused or like I went to my sister and they say, you need to do this. You should do that or my neighbor or my friend. And that is just one note of caution that I wanna to say to those uh, like for survivors, but then also folks who have never experienced domestic violence is to when somebody discloses their, like that they're going through abuse and violence, it's to really approach them with compassion and care and don't think that you know what's best for them um, because sometimes then you're just like adding on to those layers of violence and abuse and trauma that they've already experienced. And it's just, it's, it's setting them up in, in, to a really bad place. Yeah, Jimmy, two things you mentioned that came to mind is, well, one, I think our society really puts a lot of value on being in love and being in a relationship. And many people, women and men, feel that they are nothing if they don't have a relationship and that they lack value. And I see this across ages, across gender, across geographic location, education level. It's just I need someone to complete me. And so many times it's, if I don't have this person, who am I going to have? And so, and I mean, this is with any relationship, not just any bad relationship, not just abusive ones where it's like, well, if I leave this person, then who will, who will be better? Or when will I find someone next? And I think that's such an issue that we have in our society is that we place so much emphasis on being in a romantic relationship. And I feel like those those signs and those messages are everywhere. And then the second thing is what you said about systems. It reminded me of me the mental health system. Many people say, well, why don't you go get help for your mental illness? Why don't you go see a doctor? Why don't you go admit yourself to the hospital? Well, th those systems aren't good. <laughs> like they're not, they're not conducive to healing and there's, they can be scary and they are expensive and they're difficult to navigate. And I think that same thing happens with especially mothers experiencing domestic violence, the children come into play and then you most likely will have a case open with ACS and that can be such a headache. And these are just, that's just like one system that a mother experiencing domestic violence has to deal with. But the homelessness system or the, the, the shelter system, um, DV shelters, there's financial systems, it can be very scary to like have to face those systems. And that's why it's really important that we fund domestic violence organizations that work toward financially helping these, these mothers and also finding them housing security and mental health support and all these other things. But it's a very systemic issue. Sorry to go off on a tangent there, but I appreciate yeah. you bringing up those points. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and when, like, I, we started by saying domestic violence is about power and control. Those systems, are also all about power and control. Yeah. The systems that survivors turn to for help, give them rules, tell them what they need to do. Like there are so many families that we work with where it's like, why are you here in family court? Oh, well, my, my like the ACS or the shelter, they told me I have to come here and do this, even though that might mm -hmm. be the, like the least safe thing for them to be doing right now. And there's, for married victims, in some states, it's like difficult to get a divorce. It, you have to go through like six months of separation or you like you have to like have such, you know, a documented thing of why you divorce somebody. So there's there's so many systems. The court system is another one. And a lot of um, people don't feel safe, like Jimmy said, entering those systems and making themselves visible to their abuser and to their abuser's family. So thank you all so much. That was that was really great. Um, Destiny and Sammy, what was the determining factor that ended your relationship or made you exit the relationship? For me, like some factors while I was also staying was because 
I was living with my abuser and his family. So they had the power and control. And um, ultimately ACS got involved because it was a really bad physical, um, physical altercation outside. So obviously neighbors are calling, people are calling, like housing workers are calling. And they, was, they deemed that the house was like an unsafe environment to raise a child in, even though for me at this point, I was young, I was 17. I was like, all right, but we're not fighting every day. Our child didn't get hurt. And they end up breaking it down to me like they didn't get hurt this time, but you can be fighting and you can get to like push your child by accident. Or, you know, they can just be in the middle of you fighting, especially like a young child. You know, they're just starting to walk. You don't know where they're at or you know, and you don't want to even even actually introduce that to them at an early age, that violence and the arguing, because it's not good for their developmental, like, growth, you know, and ultimately, if I didn't leave that situation, they were going to possibly try to take me to court to take my child away, and of course, like, you know, as a mom, you don't want that to happen, the first thing you're going to do is like, all right, I'll find somewhere else to live, and then I end up going through the systems we we're just talking about, with Safe Horizon, um, domestic violence shelter, and it can be a lot for someone. Um, so for me, I was also living with my abuser. It was me and him. And I felt like what was the breaking point for me was actually like years down of the abuse. There was this one time where it almost killed me. And I felt like I didn't call the cops, but the building manager had to call the cops and the ambulance. And even though I didn't make a statement at that time, like that was my first time that I was like, wow, like I have lost control. And I think I didn't realize how bad it got. And, and for me, it didn't even seem I'm like. Like, I watched the, the TV shows. I learned in school about domestic violence. But I felt like actually living, like, laying down in a hospital bed. Like, I remember I, like, had, like, third-degree burns on my back and on my face and stuff like that. I was like, I, I'm a victim. And I think that right there, having to almost lose my life, was like, okay, yeah, I got to go. Like, I, I've lost control and I need to find out why it got that fast. For, so for me, unfortunately, it was the hospital. Well, being in the hospital, like I've been in the hospital before, but it was like the severity of being in the hospital almost dying. I was like, nah, I got kids, like I got family. Um, and I don't want them to find out like this. So yeah. Sammy, thank you so much for sharing that and being so open with us. And I'm so sorry that it got that far for you. Um, and I'm so glad that you're still with us today. Thank you so much for sharing that. I do wanna to touch on mental health a bit. Um, obviously mental health is affected in domestic violence relationships. Destiny and Sammy, can you share a bit about how your mental health was affected and what that looked like for you? Sorry, the mute button. For me, I didn't really notice my mental health was affected until years later. Um, because what I did was I threw myself into my work. That's what people do sometimes when they're experiencing mental health. I took two jobs. I had two jobs at this point in my life. So I would wake up and get to work by like 6.30, end at three and then go to my other job. And it was more of a part-time. So I guess I got off like around seven, eight, go home and sleep. That's what I was doing. Like I was working like a machine. Like if I could keep working, working, I can avoid what's going on. And my mental health was affected as well because at some times it was like, all right, what can I do or how can I phrase things not to start an argument? And that takes a lot. You know, you're trying to identify triggers of this person. You're always walking on eggshells in like your own house or your own surrounding. And at one point, I remember leaving work one day and I was just like, I don't want to go home. And that is like a crazy feeling to have. You'd rather stay at work than to go home, you know, lay in your own bed and like see your child. So that's how my mental health was affected. And then also when transitioning into like a domestic violence shelter, you're also thrown into like a single mom, um, a single mother household. And it's hard to adapt quickly. So I was like sad at that time because even like little things like going to the store, 
you don't have that person to like watch your child, you know, or like help you even drop them off at daycare. And if you're not used to it, it's just so hard to like, you know, get the role going. And that's how my mental health was affected. Um, I'm really similar to like Destiny's. I also hated being in the house and I will find every way to go to like this drop-in center I was at and it will open nine o'clock in the morning. I would stay at eight. It would close at 8 p.m. and I would linger around to 10 p.m. just because I didn't want to go home. And then um, eventually when that was like taken away from me and that became a problem in my relationship, like going to drop-in centers or going to work, um, and I had to stay home, I realized how depressed I got. Like, getting up to take a shower became, like, a task for me. Like, going to the grocery store became a task for me. And um, I fell into, like, a deep depression where, like, I started to have that isolation that we talked about earlier. Like, I wasn't talking to um, my little brother. We fell out for years. Um, I lost friends. I um, so I, I saw myself in the mirror and I was just like, I don't know who this person is anymore. So I feel like that's how that affected my mental health, where I didn't recognize who I was. Like, I remember, like, before I got into the relationship, like, I was happy. I was coloring my hair. I was getting my nails done. I was going out. And now it's like, this girl doesn't even want to brush her hair. And I think that's how I realized the um, mental health aspect of it. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And I think there's also that aspect of PTSD, um, which affects your future relationships too. And being very distrusting of, of men and people you're in relationships with, finding it very difficult to be vulnerable again, or you know, just when someone does something that even reminds you of the abuser, it can just trigger something in, in you. So I think there's both the mental health that's happening while you're with the abuser and then the mental health aspects, effects that happen long after. How do you all think your partner's mental health contributed to the abuse? Um, for me, my partner, he was in like foster care for a majority of his life, um, like his adolescent life. And I think he had some like PTSD of that and abandonment trauma that he has never like healed from, especially since like his family members got some of his other siblings back, but didn't get him back. It's like, it hurts, you know, like why me? And I feel that's why he wanted to take that abuse and that anger out and redirect it towards me instead of working on his actual root causes and problems that he needs to work on. So I think that's how it affected the relationship. Um, for me, so my partner and I, we met when we were both youth homeless, and um, I think his control, and, and, and I figured this out during the line, is that, like, he didn't, he was this bright personality to his friends and stuff like that, but when it came down to his, like, intimate partners, it was this control of, like, his mother kind of left him behind in New York City to go be with the man in another state, so I felt like he clung on me so hard like there was so much jealousy of like even the fact that I was working where it was kind of like oh you think you're too good now or like oh you got a job and I don't so like you think you're better than so it was always like this internal competition of like well I you can't go too much without me like he wanted all types of and that's that mental of like the way he was raised, you know, he was also raised off of like survival. So I, 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 I think a big part of it is that he also didn't have no, nobody to lean on. Like we was both 17, 18 years old and we just had to figure it out. Like we was just, Hey, you're homeless. Here's bills. Here's how to get an apartment. And we, I think that played a big part on both of our mental health, but it's just the fact that we was never taught how to love and we was never taught, um, any type of boundaries at all like it was really just whatever we felt was okay at that time whether it was right or wrong thank you I think it's really important that we touch on not only the systems that victims have to deal with through their abuse but also like what led to the abuse in the first place and why it's important that we fix these systemic issues um, for children because children are going through these systems and children grow up 
they can grow up to be abusers if they're not taught how to care for someone else, how to love someone else, what love is. If a child is abused, they're very likely to grow up to become an abuser. And so I think that's really important of what you both touched on. Speaking of children, how were your kids affected emotionally and mentally by these relationships? Um, for me, one thing I stood back on, like my child was in daycare for most part of the day. And like, I always felt like a little mom guilt, like, oh my gosh, when he could have been at home with his like other parent, if that makes sense. But I just didn't want the, I guess the headache of dealing with him throughout the day if I did leave my child with him. So I feel my child basically had to like grow up quicker than what he should have. But then also on a positive note, when we did transition into the shelter, I felt as if like my son was gonna be sad, you know, miss his father or his other parent. And, and actually he was just very happy. He was like, I guess, happy in terms maybe because I felt better and I didn't know. And that, that was rating against him, I guess. But he was happy. He was more, it was more space for him to do things that he wanted to do. And I just wanted to shed a light on that. Like you may think your kid may feel worse like leaving this environment, but like my son was happy and he started flourishing more. Um, yeah, I agree with Destiny. So my daughter and my son at the time was like three, four years old when we first got together. And um, at first, um, I'm, I'm grateful to say they never saw any of the physical abuse because that happened towards the end. But um, I remember like my daughter would ask me a lot of questions on like, well, you look sad today. Um, and that's when I realized like, oh, she's really smart. Like she's really looking at stuff. Um, but I think for me overall, um, a lot with like what Destiny was saying is that my whole relationship, I was kind of like, well, how are my kids going to feel? Because this was their only father figure at first, you know? So I felt like I was taking something away from them. So I will always do whatever I can to be like, well, my relationship with him is bad, but he never did it to the kids. Like he never emotionally or verbally abused the kids, which is kind of ironic because it was like, he was so disgusting to me. But when he got around the kids, he was literally like the best person to my kids. So I felt like that was kind of manipulation too, but a lot like with Destiny is when, um, when we did live, when I did leave or whatever, my kids also flourished. Um, they, I started to realize that they stopped asking so many questions on like, it's okay if we wake up right now and make breakfast. Like they, they was, I, I didn't know how much they was actually seeing until we left. And I was like, oh, okay. You know. Yeah, children are certainly more observant than we give them credit for. Thank you both for sharing that. Um, what support systems did you seek out and what support systems could you not find or you wish you had? Um, for me, I didn't seek out counseling or any other like program because again, I didn't want to acknowledge the elephant in the room that I was experiencing that. But our first um, physical altercation that happened, it was like shortly after my son was born. Um, our cops were called, I had called the authorities. And after a while, I'm not sure on the like particular name of the group, but the police department had the domestic violence unit. And they came to my house, like just to make sure I was okay. And, you know, like to make sure like they're staying away from me. And I wish I would have took more advantage of that and absorb the information that they was telling me, like, you know, that you are in a domestic violence, like early. And um, I know they had resources too. They had gave me pamphlets to counseling. So I wish I would have took advantage more of that opportunity. Um, for me, I, I also never seeked out DV resources when I was going through it because in my head, I didn't identify with it at first. Um, I did seek out um, like not homeless shelters because those was public but I, I would find myself kind of googling like I remember googling like safe horizon and like oh private shelters and stuff like that because I didn't really know how to word it um and then I think with me one thing that was like really big on me was like I didn't want to be given a timeline 
So I felt like a lot of times with these programs, they're like, okay, well, if you call today, you got to leave today. And I'll be like, hmm, how am I going to do that? So that for me, I was also trying to find programs that wouldn't judge me or was just like, hey, you could just come in and talk whether you leave or not. And that that's the resource I wanted. I just wanted a safe space. I didn't want for them to be like, no, today you got to make a choice. Like today you got to flip your life upside down. So I feel like the resources I was looking for was more just like, um, I'm searching up like group therapy or like group activities and stuff like that. Because I just wanted to acknowledge it and kind of get through it before I felt like I had to force myself to kind of like, and one, I didn't want to label him a monster at first. So I was really not trying to do those. I was trying to find resources that would just give me my own safe space versus a resource that was kind of like, no, label him press charges, get your kids around. Because to me, like we mentioned before, ACS is no joke. And I felt like ACS was going to blame me. I had bad experiences with cops before, definitely DV cops. And I just felt like, damn, what if they don't believe me? You know, or what if they make it seem like I'm a bad mom? So Mm -hmm. I was very limited with the resources. Yeah. And it's hard to even if you are being abused, it's hard to just label someone you've been with as a monster, you know, and because that's hard for you to recognize and accept that that's someone you've been dating, but it's also just like, wait, you might actually still love the person, even if they're abusing you. Um, and that's hard to just be like, oh, they're all of these things that are bad. Um, and then what else you mentioned is like, it leaving, physically leaving the relationship or the home is the hardest part. It's, it's something that you actually have to plan for days or weeks in advance at a time when you know that you'll be able to escape. So I like that you bring up that point of some program saying, if you need, if you're reporting it today, you need to get out today. Go ahead, Destiny. To what like delays a lot of women leaving is your kid's school, your kid's school in the neighborhood or daycare, especially if you're like on a voucher program. Like um, I had a voucher for my child's daycare and sometimes it could be a long waiting list, finding a new daycare that's willing to accept that voucher. And that's what made me ultimately stay longer than what I should have it's a huge factor in the city yeah and I believe and Jimmy correct me if I'm wrong but if you're in a DV shelter it has to be in a separate borough from the abuse the abuser yeah. right and so then the are the kids also moved um schools at that point to a new borough there are different options um it's a little complicated I mean a lot of my answers are probably going to be like it really depends and like that's such a frustrating answer to give and to hear Um, It does depend. I mean, yes, with domestic violence shelter, um, which is operated through the Human Resources Administration and they're confidential, like they have confidential locations, um, survivors can't just like, let's say there's a DV shelter down the road, a survivor is not going to be put into that shelter because it it makes no sense safety wise. Um, But in terms of navigating where kids can go to school, there are options. Um, Every domestic violence shelter Um, does have access to a coordinator to help navigate that system. Because I think what what we're talking about here is that survivors aren't navigating just one system. They're navigating so many different systems that we, as America, as New York, overcomplicate and just, it's it's a mess. So if you're in DV shelter, really ask your advocate for help navigating these systems. They should be putting you in contact to to the right people who can help you figure out all of these pieces. Thank you, Jimmy. And that kind of leads to into the next question is if you did have to involve law enforcement, how long did it take for them to act or believe you? Um, for me, the two times that I did call up authorities, they did act like very promptly. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know because that was, let's just say I was in like a, what we deem a good neighborhood compared to like other districts or other neighborhoods, they did act pretty fast and um, multiple officers did come. So that can be sort of intimidating too, like, oh my God, like why are there so many? But of course they're doing that for their safety, but um, they did act really responsively and they did follow up a lot and um, they didn't make it too hard for me to navigate and they did believe me, Um, you know, thank God that they did believe me. And I don't know whether or not that's just because like the appearance of my abuser, like he's so tall compared to like me. I don't know if that had any like um any say so on whether or not they believe me. 
but they did act pretty promptly in my situations. So the first time that I called, they also was very, um, they was, so I was actually on the phone with the drop-in center. So they was hearing the fight in the background. And I had like tucked my phone into my pocket. And I think, I think it, they came fast. But from what I heard from my drop-in center was that they was calling the police, like, no, like get your ass over there, like 10, 15 times. He was like, no, this, this girl is about to die. Um, it was very like swift, but I felt like they believed me, but I don't think that they, I felt protected or safe. I felt like right then, yes, I felt protected. Like they took me to the hospital, they took pictures and whatever like that. But then afterwards, it just felt very like handoffish. Like even when I was talking to the DA, like I remember like the cop, he was just like, he met me and my partner. And this is the crazy part because I didn't leave after he tried to kill me right away. You know, he he apologized and he blah, blah, blah. And he was just kind of like, oh yeah, couples fight all the time. And he actually put me in the room with my partner when my partner like was like yeah I'm gonna turn myself in and that kind of threw me off guard because I was like wait I'm gonna talk to somebody private I thought this was like my escape room and um this was also the time that like he forced me to get married so I thought if I was to get married the restraining order would pop up it didn't the next day the cops come and he's like oh we're getting married I thought the cop will help me like say something and he was just like no just come in we're gonna have an appointment you'll be out by the next night so I then I was like all right but this is my time if there's gonna be a room full of cops for me to be like help like I don't want to be married you forced me blah, blah blah he's waiting outside for me and stuff like that but instead he put me in the room with him and um, when the DA was talking to me, he was right there. So unfortunately, I was lying to the DA and I was kind of like, oh, yeah, it was just an argument. And he didn't know that he was throwing bleach at me. Like, he didn't know he was trying to kill me. And that's why I felt like, yes, the cops responded fast when I was almost like, but their response when it came down to like actually me trying to get out was very like slow in my opinion like I didn't get an appointment with the DA till weeks later um and then when I did get an appointment the police had to sit together and then when I did get a court date it was like three months later and I was so I was already thinking about my kids at that point I already gave up I was like yeah um I'm good I'm okay thank you um and that that was my experience with the with the cops Thank you for sharing. And I think that points to a need for better training um, and more knowledge around these situations because you shouldn't have been placed in a room with your abuser. Um, but I, my last question for the panel and before we get into resources from Jimmy is just how does how do these experiences still affect you both today? Um. So in a positive way, um, I professionally, I, I, I became more of an advocate to help like women and, and, and also men. And I feel like we don't speak enough on like the fact that it, it does happen to men and it, it happens a lot. And I'm always constantly like sharing my story because I feel like a lot of times like movies and social media make abuse seem so disgusting and ugly and nasty. And sometimes it does not start like that. Like my abuse did not start until a beautiful relationship and it didn't turn out abusive until he made sure that I was dependent on him. He made sure we had an apartment. He made sure that my friends was gone, my job was gone. So I'm constantly always trying to advocate that red flags sometimes happen after the honeymoon stages. It happens after you kind of, sometimes it happens once you guys get engaged or once you guys move in together. Um, but negatively, I feel like every relationship I have now, I'm kind of like super in tune with being super guarded. And it's like, if you raise your voice at me a little bit too much, um, I just want to remove myself. Um, and I, and I think it's never too a bad thing to have so many like boundaries, but I do feel like because of my abuse, I now have like an extra 10 boundaries. And sometimes they make me feel bad because my partner um, recently, like he doesn't complain about it, but I do recognize it where I'm like, 
in my head, I'm like, oh, this person did this. So I need you to do this, not for me. So I feel like at times I'm like super, um, like cautious now when it comes down to On like, guard, yeah. Like, yeah, like arguing or anything like that. I'm kind of like, mm. yeah, it seems if everything can kind of be a red flag, which is not a terrible thing, but it's also not a way you want to live life. Um, for me, it still bets me to this day because there's some positives. Like I'm able to just say no more to people with friends, family, or like relationship. Like I learned it's okay to say no with anything I'm not comfortable doing because if I say yes, I'm sacrificing myself and eventually I'm going to start feeling worse. And it's just not, it's something you need to learn and develop like as you grow up and how to advocate for yourself. So I just learned to advocate for me and really learn myself. Um, negative effects, like my child's father does not know where I live, of course. So like sometimes if like I get like an unexpected guest or like my bell rings super loud because I don't have the bell that you control, it's like, oh, I get like a little bit of PTSD flush, like, oh my God, like who is that at my door? And um negative effects I'll say like it does affect my um child's relationship with their father because it's not existent but then that could be a positive in a way too because then like at least I know like my child is safe um and it still affects me to this day because like I also I'm more aware of like certain circles that I navigate and people who I'm surrounding myself with as well because I don't want like the circle to get back to his circle you know and we sometimes like run into each other so I'm very mindful on who I attract as well as an adult. Thanks for touching on how you can grow from these situations and some of the strengths you developed from that abusive relationship. Um, so that ends our panel discussion. And now we're going to discuss some resources um, with Jimmy, our policy expert on our panel. Um, Jimmy, why is New York leading in domestic violence in comparison to other cities across the country? So when I saw this question, I was a little surprised because I don't think of New York City or New York State as like the lead, like um, ahead, like larger in terms of domestic violence in other cities and states. Um, I do think that statistics can be a little tricky. Um, like sometimes you'll we'll see like an uptick in domestic violence reports or um, reports of rape and sexual assault, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's an uptick in violence. Sometimes it means it's an uptick in awareness that people now know, like, I oh, there are resources, I can call this organization or I can report to law enforcement. So sometimes it's actually, you see numbers go up or rates of violence going up when um, we're actually around, like when we're building awareness campaigns. So I think that that's part of this. Um, I would say like, to, um, Domestic violence is pervasive, it's systemic. Um, it is rooted in larger systems of oppression as well, like sexism, misogyny, racism, homophobia, transphobia, all of the like um, uh, power and control dynamics around immigration status. So I, I think that one thing that I do want to just like emphasize is that we try to treat domestic violence as like this, this like one-off thing that like this person just like became an abuser. But I, I do believe that domestic violence is so much more rooted in these like larger systems. So I, I would argue against that New York is like the like the biggest driver of domestic violence across the country. But I mean, it is pervasive, it's systemic, and it's like the, our statistics that we're saying, I think are actually, um, they're, they're, I think it's more pervasive than that. Thanks, Jimmy. And are there tools for, developing safer boundaries and navigating future relationships. And then Sammy and Destiny, if you wanna chime in on things you've learned as well. So I think some of the themes that are coming up for me and what I've learned, but then also based on what um, Destiny and Sammy were sharing earlier is like, trust your instincts. Um, I mean, sometimes people take a look at the power control wheel um, for the first time. Like sometimes when we're working with a survivor, they come in um, and it's not like we're flashing the power control wheel at them as soon as they're walking in the door, but sometimes like those materials are around and people will come into like our, one of our offices and be like, this is me, this is my relationship. Um, Cause they've never seen it before. They've never seen it laid out like that before. Um, so I think one, um, like one thing is just like kind of trust your instincts. Think about 
power and control. Like, is my world getting smaller? Am I being isolated from my friends and family? Um, there are red flags like love bombing where it's like I'm getting into a new relationship and now this person like I've only met them or I haven't even met them yet and they're saying I'm the most beautiful person in the world that I'm so great they love me like those are some red flags about unhealthy boundaries and unhealthy relationships um I do think that we as a, like we collectively need to do so much more in the prevention on the prevention side of things starting with teaching kids about healthy relationships and healthy boundaries. That is one thing that like our curriculum in schools does not really cover, at least to the extent that we need it to cover. And there are age appropriate ways to teach healthy boundaries. I know that some people think like, oh, we're gonna try to teach like four year olds about like sex right now. It's like, no, I don't hear anybody saying that, but it's like, we can advocate, we could really teach kids about it, about healthy relationships, boundaries, like we can teach two-year-olds about boundaries. Like if somebody says no, like don't touch me, like listen to them. Like don't force your child to hug an aunt or uncle that they don't want to hug. Like even like that, like these are the messages that we're sending even like just like to kids. Um, and I think also just thinking about communication is also just like a giant piece of this. And like, how, how are we communicating, like um, how are me and this partner or potential partner communicating with one another? Um, I think that that is also like one of like the first um, things. Um, but I would love to hear if uh, Destiny and Sammy have other ideas. I would say, especially in terms of dating, listen when someone is talking about their past experience and their past relationship because it'll tell you the type of person you're most likely gonna date. Like sometimes people would admit like, hey, me and my partner did get into like a physical altercation before, but that was like once years ago, but then you know they have the tendency to basically make possibly get violent with you. Um, and you get like a little snippet on how you and that person's relationship might be. And expecting respect is mandatory. People who love you will respect you and they will respect your boundaries. And what I said in the beginning of the panel, it's okay to say no. Whatever you don't feel comfortable doing, especially with a the relationship, they should respect that. Um, when we hear say no, we also think of like sexual like contact, but it's more other things you can say no to. Like, and um, I will also say you have the right to your own time. Just because you're in a relationship with someone does not mean you have to be with them 24 seven, or you have to stop doing things that you enjoy. And I would also say economically to try to like have your own funds or your own income because it, it makes it easier to leave a relationship and it makes less for like a codependency um, relationship. That's just something I suggest for people. I know it could be hard sometimes, you know, especially with everything we're going through, but it's nothing like having your own money that's something I learned. Um, for me, it would be two things. I think my first advice for anybody, whether you're a DV or not, is to come up with your own boundaries, your own, you know, healthy expectations. I feel like I jumped into a relationship where we had so many responsibility and bills that I didn't, I didn't, I didn't honestly know what I wanted from my partner like I, I just thought if somebody was faithful and loyal that was that was it like well you're not cheating so that's good um so I think just having like healthy expectation and boundaries on like how you want to be treated you know having conversations which like even before you get with somebody ask them hey how was you raised how do you cope how do you feel about this um and then for people who do feel like they're may be in a TV relationship or if you if you do identify um I would say come up with a plan yourself whether it's on a napkin or in your phone and don't worry about people who tell you that you have to leave tomorrow or next week or now and it and, and leaving shouldn't even be your first thought because realistically it's never anybody's first thing to give up um and just have a safe space you know, whatever that means to you, um, come up with a safe space. What like the first the first step for me was um, I created a bag where if I did have to run, I had a toothbrush and I had my documents. I didn't care about money, but I knew I couldn't get into a shelter without an ID or a birth certificate. So I 
had this little small pouch that he didn't know about and I hid it. And I feel like with anybody, um, just think about you, regardless of what the experts say or counselors or therapy, like do what makes you feel safe. Yeah. Yeah. There were, oh, go ahead, Destiny. I would like to also add, um, you know, you are enough. You are enough. And also it's okay to be single, you know, yeah. how we were talking about earlier. It's okay to be by yourself for a short or long extended period of times because, you know, you're born in this world by yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And yeah, those two things that really stuck with me is Jimmy mentioned love bombing. Um, and I think that just our attraction to that stems from what I was saying earlier is like, we need a relationship. Media tells us like all of the movies we watched growing up, like the prince falls in love with the princess in 10 minutes. And you believe that like, that is the dream. Like that's the fairy tale, but no one can be in love with you after a few days <laughs> or a few weeks even. And it's not, it's not healthy if they are, or if they're saying they are, but love bombing looks like true love to so many people because we don't teach people what true love really is and our media is always telling us something different then the other thing that you mentioned destiny is in dating like something i always do is i ask them what went wrong what did they do wrong in their past relationship and if they can't come up with anything they've done wrong and everything is blamed on their ex then that's a really red flag to me you know like someone people do like they're people make mistakes in relationships, both, both partners in every relationship make mistakes. And if you're not able to like recognize that and verbalize it, then even if you're not abusive, like you haven't done the work to be in a healthy relationship. Um, if you're pinning everything on your ex, like that's a really, that's a really red flag, really big red flag for me. So thank you for mentioning that to destiny. Um, I do want to get into more of the resources. Um, what are some financial resources like rebuilding credits, um, you know, being able to open bank accounts and what are policies and legislation around that, Jimmy? Sure. Um, so before, and before answering, I just really wanted to emphasize like, so first of all, survivors are the experts in their own safety. Survivors are often turning to our domestic violence hotline and other programs um, because they're, the ways that they've been managing their safety and their lives, something has changed. Like usually that is like the impetus for somebody calling the domestic violence hotline. Like something is not working anymore. The way that I was managing my safety is no longer working. Um, so that's usually the first time that they're reaching out. Um, the other just piece is that, um, and I keep saying this, our systems are just so complicated. So sometimes we, we work with survivors where it's like, well, my neighbor, like I just found out my neighbor just found like this apartment um, that she qualifies for this thing, or my sister, she qualifies for this thing. So I want that thing. Um, and you might not qualify for that thing based on like your unique circumstances. So it's really, really important to speak to an advocate um, who's going to be able to help you navigate these overly complicated systems. Um, they're in the, in the house, and I think like the two biggest things that we hear people asking for help with are economic help, like navigating economic abuse, trying to fix your credit, rebuild credit, or build credit in the first place um, to like set you on like, um, like a, a, a good, healthy economic trajectory. Um, the other thing is around housing. I mean, I keep like, I keep also saying like we're at, this is a housing and homelessness crisis right now in New York City and in New York State and across the country. Um, and, we just don't have like, there are so many people, there are so many people in shelter right now. There are so many people that are unhoused that are living on the street and it is unjust and it's terrible. There are some um, solutions out there. Like I know that there are different city vouchers and different state vouchers. Um, during the pandemic, there were some more like federal vouchers out like housing vouchers out there. Um, those systems are constantly changing. Um, and a lot of times they're changing because of advocates like um, like advocates in the Family Homelessness Coalition, um, folks with lived experience like Sammy and Destiny that are using their experience to really inform policy decisions and to, to change the systems for the better. These things are constantly changing. So again, you might, you, you 
should speak to, it, it would be helpful to speak to an advocate to help you navigate those systems. Because um, again, you might not actually qualify based on the, the rules, the eligibility requirements that certain systems set up. Um, also, in one, like, just get on my soapbox for a second. Like, our shelter, like, there's different shelter systems here in New York City. Like, there's the runaway and homeless youth shelter, there's the domestic violence shelter system, then there's the homeless shelter system, um, which also has like different pieces to that, whether you're um, a, a parent with your children, you're an adult family, or you're a single adult. Based on which door you go in, our systems say you get different, um, you qualify for different things. And sometimes some of those things are better than others. Um, so again, it really all depends, which again is like the most frustrating answer in the world to be like, it really depends, but speak to it, I, I think speaking to an advocate. Um, the economic abuse space is kind of, uh, it's still, I would say a developing space that like folks have been raising awareness about this for, for years, for decades to make our lawmakers, the people in power take economic abuse seriously um, around um, not just um, uh, people taking out credit cards like in your name, but forcing you to take credit cards like that coerced debt is a piece to all of this too. Um, so there are there are resources out there and I know we're gonna be sending out like a list of resources afterwards, um, but some or and I reached out to one of my colleagues um, and they were just saying like three organizations that help in terms of like the financial abuse uh, piece are CAMBA, Her Justice and Legal Aid. Um, a good housing resource, and I use it all the time, is New Destiny Housing. The New Destiny Housing resource page is so helpful. It just explains, this is how the shelter system works. These are how all of these different um, affordable housing options work. Um, so that there are resources out there. Um, usually a good first step is calling one of the city's hotlines. Um, so I know we'll be sending this out, but Safe Horizon, we operate the 24 hour domestic violence hotline, uh, which is 1-800-621-HOPE. Um, partners in this work include the Anti-Violence Project. They have a hotline, uh, they, they specialize in working with LGBTQ plus survivors. Um, and that's abuse happening within the community, but also happening from out, externally from outside the community. They have a hotline. Womankind, they operate um, another 24 hour hotline. They specialize with working with Asian and Asian American survivors. Um, and VIP, um, they uh, specialize with working with uh, Latina um, survivors that uh, identify as Latina, Latino, Latinx. Um, they also have a citywide hotline. So I don't want to, I can't, I don't want to throw phone numbers at everybody, but usually one of those um, hotline numbers is a good first step. And that organizations know how to partner with other organizations to say, like, this is a good spot, like, this is a good place for you. Um, and then lastly, there are the five family justice centers. There's a family justice center in, one, um, in each of the five boroughs. Okay. Um, yeah. I can no, ramble that's, forever. That's great. And I I mean, the next question was about finding a, a CBO, a community-based organization or an advocate. So I really like that you touched on that. And I think we will, in our resources, we'll be sending all of these out. So don't, don't feel overwhelmed, but that it's great that we have Jimmy here. And we also, there are tons of options in the city um, and it's also important that if you're not in these situations and you have the financial means to, to donate to these organizations because they need our financial support to be able to help these victims. Lastly, Jimmy, I'm just wondering if there's any legislation right now around domestic violence going through the city or New York state that you might want to touch on. Hmm. So I know, like, so uh, Governor Hochul did just sign um, several bills um, last month. So October was Domestic Violence Awareness Month, um, DVAM. Um, I like the fact that we're having this panel on November 2nd, because we shouldn't just be talking about domestic violence, intimate partner violence, just in the month of October. And I know we don't, but sometimes other, or, like sometimes folks only care about domestic violence when it's October. Um, but the governor did sign legislation um, to help um, survivors break their utility bills um, so that they're not like tethered to the person, like their abuser, the person causing them harm. Um, and there are other, I think one thing that we're always collectively trying to advocate for is building out options. Um, Destiny and Sammy were both talking about their experience with like the, with the police, for example, what works for one survivor might not work for another survivor. Like we've worked with clients who have said, you know, going into domestic violence shelter was the best thing that I ever did. 
And another one might say like, that was the worst thing that I ever did in my life because now I'm disconnected from my neighborhood, my church, my school, my work. So like, that is another reason why you wanna speak with an advocate to help you with safety planning. Safety planning is starting with what's already been working for you and building on top of that. Walking you through what all of the different options are because then you're able to navigate like, oh, that's the option that sounds best for me or that's the option that sounds best for me. Um, so really just trying to, um, safety planning is really individualized, it's unique, um, and it's constantly changing. Like if somebody, if you go to an organization that just hands you a safety plan, like as soon as you walk in the door, that is not, that's not right. Like that is not the way that you safety plan by just handing like a to-do list to somebody. It's a conversation and it's dynamic and constantly changing. Um, one policy area, like one bill that like we're really, really excited to be pushing for in the next um, session in Albany is um, it's the Fair Access to Victim Compensation Bill. And what would it do? It would expand access to the New York State Office of Victim Services for more um, victims and survivors of violence and abuse. Where, um, so you wouldn't need a police report, for example, to qualify for crime victim compensation because there are pots of funding out there for victims of crime. So that's one bill that we're really pushing for. Um, and then last week, I mean, the city council passed a bill to create um, uh, easy, um, more low barrier access to little sums of money. Um, sometimes a survivor, what they need is $100 to pay a bill. And if they don't pay that $100, $100 bill, like they're just like set further and further back. Um, so the city council did pass a bill last week um, and it's really, really exciting. It's um, just help get survivors get access to, to the money that they need right now. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Thank you, Destiny, and thank you, Sammy. Um, we're going to move into question and answer, but before we do that, um, we are going, oh, here is a resource slide um, for folks to look at. I think we're all going to turn off our cameras for a minute and have a moment of silence for those who have lost their lives to domestic violence. And then we'll return. Okay, bringing it back now, um, we're gonna do some questions from the audience. So please feel free to type any questions you might have now into the Q&A chat. Um, I have some for our panelists just from the things we've discussed today. I'm curious, how did you explain or how would you explain DV to your kids and families in your situations? I actually, um, it was actually really hard for me to think about, definitely because being like a mom, I wouldn't really want to, I haven't had that conversation yet with my daughter. Um, but as I learned, I think when, how I'm going to explain it to her is a violation of like being comfortable and being respected, you know, and um how I would explain it even to my family because they're very like traditional and like what a husband and wife is supposed to be it's just like explaining more about like boundaries and like the new world and stuff and like it's not the 1600s like women aren't women like baby machines and like you know we we should have um our own goals like we should have our own individual individualism and stuff like that but more to the kids why like I just would really hope that if any message I could give to like my kids would be you know a lot with like destiny and Jimmy was saying earlier was like it's okay to say no and anybody that forces you to do anything that you said no to is a form of some type of abuse or manipulation and I, and I I think that's where my starting point would be. Um, for me, I have a son. Um, 
he also does have like autism. So like, I'm more scared of him like getting abused from others. So like, I do talk to them a lot on how people treat him. Um, for me, one thing like I'm trying to like instill in him is self-preservation. You have to always put yourself first in order to like help others or be enough for others. And it's okay to put yourself first sometimes. And what I also like to like tell him, don't think of your life in now like like presently think of your life like your whole life you know your life is going to change through different stages of your life you're not going to be stuck with this person forever you're going to change into a different person like your friends are going to change I keep reminding him like life is like forever changing and you're not going to be with like the same people forever and preserve yourself for the next stage of your life that's something like I try to always tell him if that makes sense to you guys, you know, because when I got into this relationship, I was 17. And for me, I thought this was going to be like my forever relationship. You know, we're going to like grow old together. When the reality is I'm not the same person I was at 17 that I am at 25. And, you know, it's okay for things to end and just enjoy it within that moment that she did have it. Thank you both. Those are really thoughtful answers. Um, Did either of you experience domestic violence in your homes growing up? Um, so now that I'm in the field that I am, I actually, like, reconnected with my mom and my little brother a few years, like, two years after my thing, and I actually had that conversation with my mom where I was like, mom, you was abused, and, um, I think growing up, I didn't, nobody really thought it was, but now that I look back at it, I was constantly always told, you know, to please a man to do this and do that and and you know I was always in front of like my mom and my dad who were arguing stuff so I was actually around a lot of DV um even with my aunts and stuff like that but it wasn't so much awareness on it back in the day in my opinion like to me it was just normal um for me I didn't have any like domestic violence experiences in my household like my mom's a single mom but I did see it a lot within my neighborhood and community. So I guess it was sort of like normalized for me at a young age. Thank you. Um, I think we'll have time for one more. What advice would you give to someone right now who is in a situation that you were once in to people that are listening, both to people who are being abused and to people who just are interested in this topic and want to help? And if you knew back then what you know now, would you have stayed as long or what would you have done differently? Um, I would say make yourself a priority before you try to figure out the what, when, who's and how's of how you're going to escape or who you're going to tell first, just make yourself a priority. Once you prioritize your safety and your well-being, everything will fall in place the cops, the, the lawyers, the court dates, it will all fall in place because now you're not going to worry about who believes you or who don't believe you. Um, that resilience of I believe myself, that's what matters. If, if you're strong and you're confident and you can stand in front of people and be like, well, I don't care if you think he's a good person because I know he's not, that's going to make such a big difference. Um, and if I knew this years ago. I think I would have left a lot sooner because I was afraid of the unknown. Um, if I would have known that there was people out there and um, programs out there that would have been like, oh, you don't really have to explain yourself or talk about yourself. I think I would have left a lot faster. Um, and yeah, I think I would have, I would have just overall, I think I would have just prioritized myself more. Um, like I was always like this thing was thrown around, like they're thrown to me, like growing up, like, oh, if someone hits you with the first time, you should leave that first time. And, um, like it's going to happen again. And I think that saying is really true. Like, I feel like sometimes we feel like, oh, it's never going to happen again. You know, like, oh, is this just this one time, you know, oh, I did this to get them angry or I should have never did this. If it happens the first time, it's more likely to happen again. And you should leave that relationship the first like sort of violent um, or like emotional abuse that you see and suspect. 
because it may only get worse. And um, for people going through that, like some advice that I would give them is just envision the love that you want to experience and envision like how you want to live your life. And if it's not aligning, this relationship is not aligning with what you want for yourself in the future, it's okay to leave. Um, that's something I do with every like aspect of my life. And it does help because sometimes, like I said before, we're just so focused on the present time and the now. And sometimes you do have to prepare for your future. So that's some advice I would give. I, I actually just want to follow up real quick because um, like, unfortunately, like in my family, they were immigrants from um, Asia. And in our culture, like when I first told my mom, she was like, well, what's the dishes done? And did you talk back to him? And like, did you get him mad first? So I felt like for those who may not have a family who's like, yo, if you get hit, want to leave. And you have a family that is like, oh, you got hit. Well, behave yourself. I think I would want to say like, there's people out there that will adopt you. There's people out there that will like love you. And um, yeah, so just, just, you know, don't worry about people that like want you to stay. There's like better things out there. Yeah, and you know what you need best. And if you feel like you're being abused or you're not in a healthy relationship, you probably aren't. And you don't need to, you shouldn't listen to people who, who push sexism and all of these standards that we have in society on you. Um, you know what's best for you, what Destiny said. Um, all right, well, that concludes our webinar today. I want to thank Sammy and Destiny so much for being so open with their stories and being willing to share. These stories are so important um, that we we make we make this issue so globally. We we need to raise awareness globally about domestic violence. Um, and we see like these two strong women on here today, and it might be hard to to see them as people who have gone through domestic violence, but that is the reality of domestic violence. So many people that you know um, and love are going through that situation, whether you believe it or not. And so I'm really, really grateful for you both to be on here to share your stories with us and for being so vulnerable. vulnerable. And thank you so much to Jimmy for bringing your policy expertise and your work at Safe Horizon um, and everything you do for victims of domestic violence. We really appreciate all three of you being with us today. And thank you to our audience members for tuning in. This was recorded and we will be sending out a recording to you as a follow-up as well as a resource, links for resources. Um, Jimmy listed plenty and we will be including those in our follow-up email. And then in the chat, we have a link to our Hear Our Voices podcast if you all would want to give that a listen. Thank you all so much for being here and have a great Wednesday. Thanks to you guys. Bye. Thanks for joining us.